Good morning. I'm Ann Schumard, and I'm curator of photographs at the National Portrait Gallery. And I have the pleasure now of introducing uh, Dr. Sarah Kate Gillespie, who I first got to know when she was in residence as a pre-doctoral fellow um, here at the Smithsonian. Uh, Dr. Gillespie holds a BA in art history from Mount Holyoke College and a master's degree in art history from the George Washington University. She earned her doctorate in the history of art at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, uh, where her dissertation was entitled Samuel F. B. Morris and the Daguerreotype, Art and Science in American Culture. She is currently uh, serving as an assistant professor of art history at York College, uh, CUNY, and she's held a number of visiting fellowships, most recently at the Library Company of Philadelphia and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and was earlier a, a in residence here at the Smithsonian at the Lemuelson Center, and then as a pre-doctoral fellow in a joint appointment uh, between the National Portrait Gallery and the National Museum of American History. She has published and lectured widely and is currently at work on a book titled One New Thing Under the Sun, The Cross Currents of Art and Science in the American Daguerreotype, 1839 to 1850. Her talk today, uh, One New Thing Under the Sun, Morse, Draper, and the Cross Currents of Early American Photography, grows out of her research for that forthcoming publication. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gillespie. Thank you, Anne. And I also wanted to thank um, Shannon and Michelle, who um, have supported my research since I was a graduate student, and, um, and also Anne at the National Portrait Gallery, everyone at the Lemelson Center and the Smithsonian, the Archive Center, um, who helped me a lot this summer in a lot of this research. And as um, Anne mentioned, um, a lot of this is pulled from the book manuscript on the same topic, um, art, science, and technology in early American photography, particularly in the daguerreotype. So. so in September of 1851, a commentator to the Bulletin of the American Art Union complained that in typical late summer New York City fashion, everyone was out of town. Artists are as rare as cool breezes, the writer grumbled. The daguerreotypists, even, have assembled in grand convention in some country town. We seem to have lost both taste and curiosity. So taste and curiosity. Clearly for this author, the artists represented taste and the daguerreotypists, curiosity. And it was this very reputation of lacking taste, however, that the assembled daguerreans had gathered to fight, off in their country town. So from all over the state of New York throughout the summer of 1851, daguerreotypists convened first in Syracuse in July, followed by Utica, Brooklyn, and New York City in August to discuss raising the standards of professionalism for their field. The profession of daguerreotyping in the United States had risen so far and so fast that many complained about a perilous lack of skill among their fellow operators, particularly the itinerants that debased the profession overall. Calls for the formations of local and national photographic art associations ensued where members could fraternize, share knowledge, um, quote, meet occasionally in scientific organization, and set a common price for plates. So the message was clear. Daguerreotyping as a profession had finally grown up, and it was now time for unity, standards, and professionalism throughout the field. And certainly 1851 was a momentous year for the American daguerreotype. Um, there were several markers of it having reached maturation. Um, in addition to these organized conventions and, and conferences, the calls for a national organization in the field, 1851 saw the publication of the second journal, American journal, I should say, devoted exclusively to photography, the photographic and fine art journal. There on the right, um, Samuel Dwight, Dwight Humphreys, the Daguerrean Journal, had just come out the year before. Um, additionally, 1851 marked the opening of the Crystal Palace exhibition in London, at which it was the general consensus that the American daguerreotypes were far superior to those exhibited by other countries. Indeed, it was regarding the American showing at the Crystal Palace that the New York Tribune editor Hor Horace Greeley remarked, quote, in daguerreotypes, we beat the world. And it wasn't just Americans who thought their country had beaten the world in the photographic department. One of the British guidebooks to the exhibition remarked, quote, in photography, the American department was particularly rich. 
And it is but just to state that many important improvements in the details of our photographic processes have been supplied by the skill and unwearied experimental research of our transatlantic cousins. So Americans did not invent the daguerreotype, but in the 12 years since it had been introduced to their shores, they improved upon it to such a degree that it was often referred to as the American process. And we might hear more about that from Francois tomorrow. So how did American daguerreotyping in 12 short years go from being a French invention to the American process? Um, so it's this period of invention that we're here to talk about this week. Um, photo historian Alan Trachtenberg has successfully demonstrated that in its heyday, the daguerreotype in America came to stand for truthfulness, innovation, and modernity. But when the daguerreotype was first introduced to America in 1839, however, it was, it was something wholly and remarkably new. Right? Simultaneously a product of science and innovative technology, yet one which resulted in a visual object. It was, as the title of this talk reminds us, one thing new under the sun in an age of increasing technological innovation. The identity of the medium did not yet exist. It had to be created. Of course, aspects of that identity came from pre-existing sources, conventions of painted portraiture, for example, or engraved scientific illustrations. But other aspects were formed from scratch due to the daguerreotype being a new sort of hybrid, one having its roots in both fine art and in science and technology. So art and science. These are the two poles that photographer and theorist Alan Sekula has termed the quote unquote shattering ghosts of the medium's past. And truly the daguerreotype in particular is haunted by these noisy spirits, but it is to my mind a useful and necessary haunting. Um, an equally important ghost, in, especially in relation to American photography is technology. Um, and of course art and science have always been connected. They continue to be so today. Um, the photographic imagery associated with these two fields has been the topic of some contentious debate among scholars, particularly art historians, which I am one. But um, while we think that some images, uh, particularly photographic images, are artistic and some as scientific, there have been and always will be some that continue to cross these boundaries. Um, there's a lot of overlap. Especially in the very early period of photography, there's this overlap between what was thought of as an artistic, artistic daguerreotype and what was created for purely scientific or technological means, as the early daguerreotype was itself both visual and a scientific object, um, a lot of which we've just heard about from Greg. Now, the first daguerreotypists in the United States mirror the kind of disciplinary interweaving that's apparent in the daguerreotype itself. In the medium's very early days, the idea of what constituted a typical daguerreotypist and a typical daguerreotype was very much up for grabs. So one of the questions that particularly interests me about early American photography is what happens when experimenters from professions as diverse as a medical doctor, a chemist, a lamp maker, a man who makes weighted scales, a metallurgist, a fine artist, and a dentist all become the vanguard of a new technology and the creators of a new form of visual imagery. And what sorts of images do they produce? So today I'm going to be focusing on a few of these kinds of images, these very early images um, that are in the Smithsonian's collections, and mostly those that are produced by two of the earliest American practitioners in the medium, artist Samuel F. B. Morse and John William Draper. So the Morse-Draper partnership is exemplary of the interdisciplinary nature of the early daguerreotype in America. Both were professors at the University of the City of New York, now NYU, um, Morse of literature of the fine arts, Draper of chemistry. Both had experimented with the basic science that is photography before the 1839 announcement of Daguerre's and uh, William Henry Fox Talbot's discoveries. And upon that announcement, both were immediately driven to experiment with the new technology in an attempt to create a permanent impression themselves. And as we know, the two joined forces in opening a portrait studio in the spring of 1840. That was only the second of its kind in New York City. And um, they later claimed they ran their business under a strict division of art and science, which with each partner contributing to the, in their area of expertise, which you know, we'll, we'll examine that a little bit, see how true we think that is. Now, but theirs was not the only cross-disciplinary alliance engendered by the arrival of the daguerreotype in the medium's nascent years. So there they are. There's our, our characters, Morse and Draper. Um, the daguerreotype made for some strange bedfellows, right? So other early associations include Alexander Wolcott, represented here by his camera, 
we heard some about him yesterday, who was a manufacturer of dental equipment with an experience in optics. He pairs up with John Johnson, who had worked as a jeweler and a watchmaker's assistant. So both of these guys are coming more from the um, mechanical arts background, but still, it's sort of an odd pairing, um, jeweler, watchmaker, dental equipment. Um, now together, these two guys opened the first daguerreotype studio in New York City, as most of us know. And of course, as we heard a lot about yesterday, Wolcott is remembered for his invention of a daguerreotype camera with a concave reflector. Now they were assisted, also as we heard a lot about yesterday, by telescope maker Henry Fitz Jr. down there below, um, who soon went into business on his own in Baltimore. And we heard a lot about that yesterday. So already we have sort of this, this little rogues gallery gathering of, of people, you know, getting together. Now this is some, some of the characters in the New York crowd. Let's move over to Philadelphia and see what's going on there. In Philadelphia, we have John McAllister Jr. Um, who supplied lenses to Daguerreotypus. He was a prominent optician so somebody from the lens making business. Now he supplies lenses to Robert Cornelius, there he is, a metallurgist and lamp manufacturer, to William Mason, represented here by one of his um, early daguerreotypes of McAllister's optic shop here, so this is William Mason's, um, who was an engraver. He also gives lenses to Paul, Ge Paul Beck Goddard, a chemist, and Joseph Saxton, who is an instrument maker who worked for the United States Mint. So here's our Philadelphia cast of characters. Morse originally approached Wolcott to be his partner instead of Draper, who of course eventually became his partner. Saxton, down in Philadelphia, ruled a diffraction grating for Draper that we just heard about from Greg. We know that Goddard and Cornelius joined forces. Wolcott up here exhibited his plates, not as far as I can tell, not in his hometown of New York, even though that's where his studio was, but we do know that he exhibited down here with the Philadelphia crew in uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in, I think, 1839, possibly 1840. So I feel like among these early experimenters, there's this vibrant exchange, this vibrant network that exchanges ideas, information, supplies, and images. And um, I'm less familiar with the Boston crowd, but particularly between New York and Philadelphia. These guys all knew each other. They're exchanging um, all kinds of information. Now, interestingly, among all of these early American innovators, our friend Samuel Morris was the only well-known artist of the group. Um, and of course, a very prominent artist he was. At the height of his artistic success from around 1825 to 30, he was awarded the most prestigious portrait commission of the decade, that of the Marquis de Lafayette by the city of New York. He was a well-regarded member of the city's cultural and intellectual elite, and uh, he painted portraits of Knickerbocker luminaries, such as Governor DeWitt Clinton, seen there on the right, um, poet William Cullen Bryant as well. In 1826, most importantly, he co-founded the National Academy of Design, which was the first arts organization in the United States run by artists. And of course, the uh, National Academy is still in existence today, still a vibrant arts organization in, in New York and serving the country. Um, and he served as its president for the next 20 years. He also delivered the first series of lectures devoted to the fine arts in this country. And it can be argued that Morse did more to promote and advance the state of fine art in the United States than any other figure in the first half of the 19th century. Of course, Morse is also primarily remembered for his invention of the electromagnetic telegraph. And he had long held an interest in both technology and the fine arts, and this includes during his most productive and successful period as a painter, again in the 20s and 30s. So this interest manifested itself chiefly in mimetic reproductive technologies, um, including the daguerreotype, and arguably culminating in the telegraph, in which electricity is used to physically reproduce or mechanically transcribe the mark of the letter or number in Morse code onto the devices receiving tape. The daguerreotype provides an obvious link between Morse's two careers, which are often treated as separate and discrete by scholars. Of course, because the process embodies in the one medium the ability to create both a visual result and to engage in these kinds of technological and mechanical experiments that he's long enjoyed, which I'll describe for you momentarily. Um, but his interest in technology in general, I think, and the daguerreotype in particular, can serve as a, as a case study for the emerging importance of technology during this period of American history, which I think helped foster an environment suitable for the explosive success of the daguerreotype when it arrived in 1839. 